Let's take a look at module nine, all about liabilities, what we owe, what we need to be paying back. We've already been introduced to simple notes payable in our class. This chapter introduces some more complex liabilities and students find this to be a very challenging chapter. Now, as I was getting ready to prepare this, I wanted to draw a little clip art image of liabilities and I was like, what do I draw? I wasn't sure what to draw. So I asked ChatGPT, hey, what's an example of a picture I might draw? Generate a clip art image to symbolize debt or owing somebody. And this is what it came up with, a pretty depressing view of debt. But that's my view of debt on a personal level. I try to avoid debt and it's something that I don't like when I owe somebody money. Um, but you'll learn if you go on to a corporate finance class, your finance professor will tell you there are optimal levels of debt and companies use debt as a tool. I'm personally, I must confess, not a big fan of debt. But that said, uh, we companies do borrow money and we need to learn how to account for that. So when companies borrow money, often they just take bank loans or, or notes payable like what we've learned already in class. And that's about as complicated as it gets. So journal entries, you already know a lot of debt and liability related journal entries. But there's one notoriously difficult topic that we're going to cover in uh, I'm going to introduce it in this video. We're going to cover it as the chapter goes on. But this picture inspired me because when my students have to deal with dun, 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 bonds, it's a topic that they don't like. They're just like, oh no, bonds. It's a challenging topic. And I think this video is going to help them. And I think it's going to help you sort of demystify bonds. Because when we talk about, you know, a bank loan, I think everybody understands what a bank loan or a car loan is because we can speak about it. Or if I talk about, you know, assets, oh, they bought a building, they bought some equipment. Everybody has an idea. When I talk about bonds, I think most people don't know like even what it means. So this video, I'm going to introduce what it means. And I'm going to talk about why it's kind of tricky to account for bonds and then in future videos we'll actually do the accounting for it. but this is just an introduction to bonds if you are in a class where you're not going to cover bonds skip the video really or unless you're curious about bonds then carry on with me so um let's talk bonds so uh, here's a news story. MIT sells $500 million in taxable century bonds. Earlier today, I have the right pen yet. Earlier today, MIT sold $500 million in Series E taxable bonds maturing in 2116 and yielding 3.885%. I'm not going to say 3.885% a million times. Let's call it four for our conversation. Okay. So this is a funny turn of phrase. MIT sells bonds. What they could be saying and should be saying is MIT borrows $500 million. Now, when they sell bonds, it means, you know, if MIT wants to borrow money, of course, they can go to the bank and they can say, hey, banker, I want to borrow $500 million. And the banker could say yes or no. Or, you know, a big company like this or a big organization like MIT, they go to the bank and they negotiate. They don't just go in and go, oh, okay, we'll take whatever you're given. No, they're, they're going to various banks and they're hard driving and they're trying to get the best interest rate. Cause look at this deal. It's $500 million they're borrowing and they're going to pay back in 2116. I borrow $500 million today and I give you your money back in a hundred years or 90 years. Like it's a long term borrowing situation. Um, and so, the bank might just say, no, we don't do 100 year deals, we'll do 30, you know, or the bank might say, sure, we'll do 100 years, but 8%, right? They might give us a bad percentage, they might just refuse. And so that's likely what happened here. MIT tried to borrow in the bank for one reason or another said, ah, you know what, we can't do the deal. And MIT, their finance office thought, hmm, well, maybe somebody will. What if I package this $500 million up into little notes payable, and I try to get investors to buy them. Do you think there might be anybody interested in buying? And well, the answer was obviously yes. Investors did buy their bonds. And so they break these $500 million up into $1,000 pieces. And, and it's just notes payable, like a bunch of $1,000 notes payable that add up to $500 million. And then they do sell them. Like they try to get somebody to invest. You give me $1,000. I promise to pay you back the $1,000 in 2116 with 4% interest. Now, importantly, nobody's buying the bond if MIT doesn't promise to pay the interest on an ongoing basis. In other words, if you just wait 100 years, 
you're going to be dead. You're not going to get any money. So MIT not only promises to pay 4% interest per year, they'll make payments every six months. So let's imagine you're a retiree. You give MIT the million bucks. They give you 4% per year. That's $40,000 per year. And you think I can live on 40 grand a year and divide by two. So that's per year they write you a check of $20,000 per six months, right? So every six months, you go out to your uh, mailbox and you go, mm, look at that, or you check your direct deposit and you go, I got $20,000 from MIT. That's what's in it for you as the investor. And why is that attractive as an investor? Well, you could buy an S&P 500 index fund, or you could buy Apple stock or Nvidia stock or Google stock or whatever company you wanna buy, but then you gotta deal with the ups and downs of the stock market. You know, the president announces some new deal and the stocks all go down and you go, oh, there's my retirement. Or the president announces a new deal and the stocks go up and you're, you, you're in boom times. It's stressful though. If you watch stocks on a day-to-day -day basis, they do go up and down. This is not stressful. You just have to say, is MIT still a university? If it is, they're going to be paying me my $20,000 every six months. I can have faith in that and I can retire on that. So they call this fixed income as an investor because it's the same amount and it's a fixed cost for MIT. So MIT is borrowing and it's an attractive way for them to borrow. Now, this is not normal borrowing. You and I can't do this. So MIT would approach an investment bank like Goldman Sachs or Credit Suisse or something like this, and those companies, those investment banks would underwrite the deal. They would make this happen, right? They would bring enough investors in and uh, investors would buy the uh, notes payable, the bonds uh, from MIT with, with Goldman Sachs serving as a middleman or Credit Suisse or whomever. So that's sort of what's going on here. Now, all of this, I know it sounds convoluted, accounting for it's actually not that hard. They're just notes payable. So we already know how to do notes payable. They're notes payable where you make an interest payment in the middle, not complicated. Here's where the complexity comes in, in accounting. There is a market for bonds, right? And investors are free to invest in whatever they want. So let's say at the same time MIT is offering its 4% bond, Harvard here has a very similar bonds, very similar terms, and Harvard's offering 7%. Well, which one are you going to buy as the investor? The answer is investors are all going to pile into Harvard. They're going to say, oh, give me the Harvard. You know, I don't... Like you have to be really biased to want to pick Harvard or MIT. You know, I, I think they're both good for their money. I think they're both going to pay me back. I, I trust them both equally. Um, give me the 7%, right? Like as an investor, I'd be like, oh, please give me the 7%. And as a consequence, nobody's going to want the MIT bond. And so Goldman Sachs or their investment bank is going to have to negotiate and they'll say, well, what if we give you a discount? You know, you're going to buy these bonds are in thousand dollar pieces. What if we let you buy the MIT bond for $950 and MIT will pay you back a thousand and they'll pay you interest as if you loan them a thousand, but you only got to pay 950 for it. And maybe the investors say yes or no. And back, you know, it's, it's a market for this. And there's, it's a math equation, honestly, but there's a market for this and they'll come to a number. And so let's say the number is, uh, so it's for a thousand dollar bond, you know, 500 million, but it's for uh, broken up into thousand dollar pieces. And the number is $900. People are willing to buy this one for 900, uh, instead of buying the Harvard one. Let's just say that's the number we come to. Well, that means at the end of the life of the bond, MIT's got to pay back a thousand dollars and they issued the bond with a hundred dollar discount. This discount represents extra interest. We talked about our million dollar person. Well, this is easy interest, right? It's $20,000 interest expense every six months, debit interest expense, credit cash every six months. Easy peasy. This discount, right? The fact that we only paid 900, but we're going to have to pay, or we only got, as it, we're at MIT, we only got paid 900. We're going to have to pay back a thousand. This hundred dollar discount is extra interest. And this is the crux of the chapter. When we learn how to deal with calculating the extra interest, the discount or the premium and dealing with the extra interest, 
that's a challenge and by the way maybe the harvard bond you know they ask for a thousand people are love the bond so much maybe they pay harvard eleven hundred and fifty dollars for the bond in that case harvard got a premium and their accountant's going to have to deal with that premium, which is a reduction in their interest cost over the life of the bond. So kind of a complex concept, but I hope it's fairly clear. A bond is a company borrowing money, and it's just a group of notes payable. The challenge of the bond is the fact that it exists in a market where people buy and sell above or below the sticker price of the bond and coping with the discounts and premiums is the big challenge in front of us this chapter. This is best done by doing examples, so please work through the chapter with me and I can't wait to get started. See you in the next video. Bye for now. The next video in our series is right up here and if you want a supercut of all of the videos in this series, that's the one down below.